When is a supernova too close for comfort? Will the USA's moon race against China accelerate a race towards a Mars base? How can we see the Oort cloud? And Q&A Plus, what do I say to space deniers? All this and more in this question show. It's time for the question show. Your questions, my answers, as always, wherever you are across my channel, if a question pops into your brain, just write it down, I'll gather them up, and I'll answer them here. All right, let's get into the questions. Space infrastructure. If China beats us back to the moon, do you think the US and its partners will go all in establishing a base on Mars? No, I don't think so. Like, I definitely think that China is going to set foot on the moon by 2030. You know, if, if not 2030, it'd be 2031. It'll be around then. And then they are going to proceed. Like, they have a plan and they're going to proceed through their plan. And that plan includes more missions to the moon, a longer stay, they're going to keep, you know, and eventually they're going to build some kind of permanent station on the moon. And then they also have plans to then begin going to Mars. But like setting up a permanent station on Mars is going to be an incredibly expensive activity. And we saw with the Apollo era, when you had the moon race, when you had the Soviet Union and the United States racing to be who could be the one who set foot on the moon the first and it turned out to be the Americans. And they, you know, 12 astronauts walked on the moon from 1969 to 1973. And then that was it. They did it, they won. And then they didn't go back because it's just so expensive. Like you should see graphs of NASA's budget up to and through the Apollo era, and then how it went through the space shuttle era and into more recently, it is like this huge spike. And then it comes down and down and down and down. And so the modern era is a fraction of the GDP that the United States was spending back during the Apollo era so they could have people walk on the moon. Um, and so any missions to Mars are going to have to be done within that tiny budget. And so that's going to mean that things are going to take a long time. And at the very best, you're going to have somebody set foot on Mars and come home. Like that'll be the culmination of all of that technology, probably for a couple of decades, is that one person or two people will set foot on Mars and come home. Obviously, there are people who are saying otherwise, and like they'll have to prove it, right? Like, let's see those rockets fly. Let's see those rockets fly to Mars. Let's see those rockets return home from Mars. Let's see cryogenic propulsion happening in space, uh, transfer in space. Like there's like a whole laundry list of things that have to be done before we can see some kind of sustainable explorers to and from Mars. So there's no benefit to establishing a base on Mars beyond science beyond political posturing. And I think for China, demonstrating that they are a technological force to be reckoned with that they are that they get a seat at the at the big table. Uh, this is how they do it, right? They go, we went to the moon, we now we're the only people on the moon. Now, and then we went to Mars. And now we're the only people on Mars, right? You should buy our stuff, you should invest in our electric vehicles, like the best technology in the world, the most advanced technology in the world comes from China, because we've got people on Mars. Right, that's going to be the story that they're going to tell, and it's a compelling story, right? But I don't think that other nations are going to be willing to spend that kind of money, and I don't think you know. There's a lot of other nations that have, you know, the United States has the momentum of being a high tech country for decades, and I don't think they're going to be looking to spend that kind of money to just maintain a presence on Mars. So. But it's but I could be totally wrong. But I think the best case scenario is that it's an international collaboration that every you know, people from China and the US and from Europe and India go together, you know, one from each of those nations. I know Europe is not a nation, right? Um, I don't know, a Latvian. Um, so go to Mars and return. And then later, it is a permanent base that's set up by humanity for humanity. And that's the only one that is sustainable, really, is a station that is by humanity for humanity, in my opinion. Lieutenant Nuke, how close would a supernova have to be to cause any damage to Earth? Are there any stars nearby that pose this threat? So a supernova would probably need to be in the 10 to 20 light year range, maybe up to 50 light years away 
to cause any damage to the earth if it went off. And the kind of damage like if you were really close, like say it was five light years away, 10 light years away, then the damage would be just a huge influx of radiation. And that would be very bad. But even if it is in that sort of 10 to 25 light year range, then what you get is the radiation hits the earth, it causes damage to the ozone layer. And then that means that increased amounts of radiation can hit the earth from space. And so that's also a very bad day or bad decade until the ozone layer replenishes itself. No, there are no stars very close that can cause any damage to the Earth. So we're completely safe right now. Now the ones that you do have to worry about are gamma ray bursts. These are, uh, you know, very massive stars that when they go off, you get these jets that form out of the poles of the star. And if the star is pointed towards you, then it's like this death ray that comes out of the star. And it can do that same damage that stripping away the ozone layer of your planet halfway across the Milky Way. And so you know, we cannot know if any of these stars are pointed, you know, all of the stars that we think could cause gamma ray bursts in the future, they're not pointed towards us. The most famous example of this is Wolf Rye 104. And that's a binary star that's in the last days of its life is probably giant stars, two giant stars orbiting around each other, one giant star with a binary companion. And for the longest time, it looked like this weird spiral in the sky was being created by these stars as they were going around each other. And so if you're seeing the spiral, then it feels like you're looking at it face on. And it is, you know, on the order of hundreds, thousands of light years away, like it's relatively close. And so if it was pointed at us, then that would be a very bad day. Like that's way too close. But uh, recently, astronomers have have calculated the actual angle of the star. And it looks like the poles are pointed away from us. So we're, we're fine, we're safe. Um, but there was a, a gamma ray burst that went off in another galaxy, millions of light years away. And the Earth's atmosphere wobbled when the gamma ray burst hit us. So uh, gamma ray bursts are next level, and they're random. You don't know when they're going to happen. It's entirely possible that mass extinction events in the past have happened because of gamma ray bursts that scored a direct hit on our planet. But, you know, life has been around for a long time on Earth. Everything seems to be fine. Uh, chances are life will last a lot longer on Earth. Everything will be fine. Uh, there are many other things that we should be concerned about, like our health and, you know, brushing our teeth. It's time to shout out our new patrons at the $5 level and above. Stephen Jonash, Wolfgang Klotz, Lawrence Johnson, Harmut Holzgrafe, Jonas Colgan Mitbo, Ba Shu, Cutter Jack, Greg Tatum, Eric Onrend, and Johan. Join the community at patreon.com slash universe today. Stephen Eichenhorn, I understand we can't visualize the Oort cloud. Do you have any upcoming missions that would allow us to do that? Or if not, what would be needed so that we could see the Oort cloud? We can never see the Oort cloud. Um, the Oort cloud is just too far away. Uh, like people just like you have to wrap your mind around the vast scale of the Oort cloud. You've got comets and objects that are, say, larger than a kilometer across that are 50,000 astronomical units away from the sun that they, they are one to two light years away, halfway between us and Alpha Centauri, the Oort cloud extends out. And it is at its closest point, more than a 1000 astronomical units. And so we can't see objects smaller than a couple of 100 kilometers across, you know, farther than the the Kuiper belt. So like 50 astronomical units is when our ability to see small objects pretty much starts to drop off. And you're going to be looking at much, much further away. So how would you see the Oort cloud, you would have a telescope that is a kilometer across, you know, some space telescope that is gigantic. The closest that we did to that was the wise survey. This was a space telescope that was launched more than a decade ago. It's the wide field infrared survey 
Explorer. And this was an infrared mission and it's it had a bunch of jobs. It was going to look for weird objects in the infrared, other kinds of galaxies. And it was also looking for asteroids because asteroids are, are quite visible in the infrared. And it was also exploring the Kuiper Belt. And one of the big challenges they were trying to do was, can we find a brown dwarf that is part of the solar system? And they did a comprehensive survey and they were able to rule out that there aren't any brown dwarfs. They're also able to rule out that there aren't any Jupiter sized objects about 10,000 up to 10,000 astronomical units away. So we we know there isn't a, a planet X out there that's really big. Uh, and I think they were also able to rule out like Neptune sized objects out to 1000 astronomical units. So, you know, there could be a, this planet mysterious planet nine, but it's not going to be very big. It's going to be Earth sized, or it's going to be Neptune size, but it's going to be much farther out. And, and like, that's the limit of the telescopes we've launched so far, you could make a more sensitive instrument, and maybe you could find objects that are 1000s of kilometers across out in the Oort cloud. But that's about it. And so like, we're just, it's just so far away. So we have to wait. But but good news, the Earth cloud is is throwing, hurling comets into the inner solar system, we just have to wait for them to fall in. And then we can observe them as they go by, calculate their orbits, figure out where they came from, and then watch them as they leave us again, never to come back. Visto 2D, what kind of telescope would be needed to see the light from the absolute farthest that we can see? Well, the absolute farthest that we can see is the cosmic microwave background radiation. And you know, if you have an old television with rabbit ears, then some small percentage of the radio waves that your television is picking up are photons that came from the cosmic microwave background radiation and are changing the picture on your screen. We've just got snow on your screen. Some of those photons, like some of those radio waves are the CMB. And so what do you need to to see the farthest light is a like a television aerial, and we will never be able to see beyond the cosmic microwave background radiation because before then, everything was opaque. So we could build a gigantic telescope and it wouldn't get us past that point. 13.8 billion years ago, plus 380,000 years, like like 380,000 years after the Big Bang, that is the farthest that we will ever be able to see with the electromagnetic spectrum. Even a trillion years from now with the most advanced technology, we won't be able to see through that with electromagnetic. Now we can see in neutrinos and gravitational waves, but with you know, but for telescopes, the CMB is the limit. Did you know that you can watch the same video with no ads and get a bonus question over on Patreon completely for free? We call it Q&A Plus. And this week's bonus question, what do I say to space deniers? And I'll put a link in the show notes. All right, those are all the questions that we had this episode. Thank you everyone who asked your questions in the YouTube comments, everybody who asked questions during the live show. We are still on our live stream hiatus, but we're getting very close to returning just a little over a week now. So uh, stay tuned for the next event. I'm going to chat about how I learned how to do my job better. But first, I'd like to thank our patrons. Thanks to Abe Kingston, Andrew Gross, Barry Kroofing, Brian Bowdy, Carrot One, Chuck Hawkins, Commander Baylock, Sai Nielsen, Dave Giltonen, David Matz, Evan Pro, Hudson Ward, James Clark, Jeremy Matter, Jim Burke, Jordan Young, Josh Schultz, Marcel Smith, Michael Purcell, Monzo, Nick Borkis, Nick Solari, Paul Robach, Ren Kaidu, Richard Williams, Sean Sargent, Stephen Fallon Munley, Vlad Shiplin, and Wolfgang Klotz, who support us at the Master of the Universe level. And all our patrons, all your support means the universe to us. So one of the things that I do as part of my Patreon campaign is that every person who signs up as a patron, I send an email that invites them to do a personal private conversation with me. And this is real, right? Like, like you're actually talking to me for about 15 minutes, you know, longer for having a really good time. Um, and the goal of this is sort of two parts. One is that as a creator on the internet, the general vibe that you get from making stuff is negative, that people uh, try to troll you or just hit you with cynicism and it makes your soul sad. Um, and anybody who has done anything, you know, created anything, put it out there on the internet, you see it. When you look at how people talk about celebrities, like, can you imagine being on the receiving end of that much just kind of 
vitriol and bile. And so it is really good for the soul to just chat with your fans, with the people who are consuming the content and their subscribers. Like these are the people that I am making the content for. I'm not making it for the, the randos who just show up and are, you know, denying space or whatever. So that's the first reason. And it's like, I walk away going, man, human beings are the best. And so I think it's really important to do this. There's a, there's a Stellar's J just freaking out outside my window. The second reason is to get better at my job. And so we produce a lot of content and we cover a lot of topics, but it wasn't really until I started to have these one-on-one -on -one conversations with people to really understand what we're creating and how it resonates with the audience. And one of the things that I learned really early on was that people prefer stuff that is very near future focused, where we're not talking about Dyson spheres at the end of time or how to live around black holes. Like a lot of that stuff is just so nebulous, pardon the pun. It's really hard to be able to sort of see how this is like a, a practical path. Like, like the singularity is coming. How do we even think about what comes after that? But instead, it's about kind of practical engineering solutions to problems. It's about, it's about new ideas to solve what seem to be longstanding mysteries in astronomy. It's about interesting ideas for new observatories, new missions, that kind of thing. And, and that's the kind of content that I like the best. And so when I was having these conversations with people and realizing this was really resonating with them, it sort of gave me more encouragement to continue down and double down. And so a lot of the interviews that I do, a lot of the people that I talk to, it's in that realm because I was able to find out that that's the th kinds of things that the audience really likes. So uh, if you're a creator, um, and I know it's very difficult and a lot of your introverts, I'm an extrovert, but a lot of people who create are introverts and, and sort of feel very uncomfortable about connecting with the audience, I highly recommend it. It's a very valuable process. And I've had maybe one bad experience in the 1200 plus interviews that I've done so far. Um, mostly, I just feel grateful to be able to have these kinds of chats. So uh, yeah, this is the thing that I do. I highly recommend that you do it as well. Of course, if you do want to talk to me, join my Patreon patreon.com slash universe today. All right, we'll see you next time.